So we introduced the timing diagram. We know that certain things have to happen on both sides, uh, use the control signals and also use the actual address of data to communicate, uh, use the address bus and data bus to communicate. We have different roles in such communications. We have an actor, uh, which is also called a master. Um, uh, sorry, uh, a master initiates and servant respond. Uh, we have uh, these two roles in general. And we have directions of the transfer. Uh, the one sending data out is called the sender and the uh, recipient is called the receiver. We have addresses and also we expect to have data um, being read or write. Um, we can use addresses to specify location in memory, a peripheral, or a register within a peripheral. Now, for some cases, if we do not have a lot of wires, we may have to reuse the wire for different purposes. This is a good example of time multiplexing. Uh, the goal is to share a single set of wires for multiple pieces of data. What we're seeing here is a master uh, actor and a servant actor. And we are trying to uh, send the data uh, from one side to the other side. However, the data bus is only 8-bit, whereas the data itself is 16-bit. So we really have to do something to um, successfully transfer all the 16-bit to the servant from the master using this 8-bit bus. And we have no other choice other than sending the data in two chunks. So that's why you see uh, we have to break data into two chunks, 15-bit uh, bits to 8-bit, and then 7th-bit to 0th-bit. You need to get used to the numbering. We always number um, the lowest bit or least significant bit as bit zero. So that's why the most significant bit of the 16 bit number is gonna be bit 15. So we, in this case, we uh, reuse the data bus um, and be able to transfer more bytes um, by sending the uh, longer word uh, multiple times. And the other case uh, that we see on the right side is, apologize for that, um, is to transfer um, both address and data. Um, the example on the left side, we are not dealing with any address because there's only one um, storage or run register uh, on the servant. Whereas in this case, we have a you can imagine a more complex device. You have larger um, storage space, which has to be accessed using an address. So in such a case, we have to send both address and data. And again, we have a much narrower bus than the actual data width uh, and the uh, size of the address. So what we have to do is to break the address and data uh, transfer into separate transactions. First, we'll transfer address. So that's the first one. And then the second um, cycle or uh, transaction, we will transfer the actual data. So this is called address bus multiplexing. Next, we're gonna look at some basic protocol concepts. Uh, or how the um, master controls the transfer. So the first example is what we call the strobe protocol. It's rather simple. We have a master and a servant, and uh, the master is going to request some data from the servant. So that you can see there's a control signal request going from the master to the servant. And we have a data bus and that is uh, one unidirectional uh, going from the servant to master. So this is a read operation. 
So we're going to use this following timing diagram to describe the operation, to describe such a protocol. So we will first, uh, the master will um, raise this uh, request signal uh, from zero to one, to indicating there's a request for the servant to transfer data. And then after some time, as we indicated here, T axis, after this amount of time, we expect the servant to put the valid data on the data bus. And that's step number two. And the third step is that uh, here, but between the second and third uh, moment, uh, we expect the master to perform the read operation. Because after this moment too, uh, we know the value data is available on the data bus. So the master will be reading the data during this time frame. And after the reading is completed, master will deassert the request signal and then fin fin finishing up the, um, the transaction. And for the servant, once it sees the request signal is uh, lowered back to uh, voltage zero, let's say, it knows that the master has finished reading, so it will stop putting the data on the bus. So that's why you see at the step number four, uh, servant finish um, sending out the data and it's ready for the next request. So really there is no um, complicated uh, um, communication because everybody is agreed upon this T access time. That's why when you read time, uh, read the timing diagrams in data sheet, you will need to pay attention to this T access time um, when you have two components uh, put onto the same uh, circuit. You want to make sure that the T access time is followed if this protocol is uh, such a stroke type of protocol. Um, the one on the right side is a little bit complicated. We call it handshake protocol. Physically, you can see that we have one more signal. Uh, we have a ACK, which, is, which stands for acknowledgement. Still, we are transferring data from the servant to master, and the master initiates that transaction. The first step, the master would assert the request signal as we did in the strobe protocol. And the second step, the servant puts data bus and assert ACK. Now this asserting of the ACK is important if the servant cannot guarantee such a T access time. The T access, as we see in the earlier, this strobe protocol, this is agreed upon on both sides. But if there's no such T access time, so this could be uh, a variable. This could be long, could be short. That means the servant could take longer to put the data, um, valid data on the bus, or take shorter time. So with this ACK coming from the servant and going into the master, the servant can say, hey, master, when you see my asserting this ACK, you know that my data is valid. So that's why you see that this data is slightly, you know, the valid data is earlier than the ACK is asserted, which is reasonable because the servant has to make sure the data is valid on the bus before it actually asserts this ACK signal. The master will uh, look at the ACK. It will not read until it sees the ACK. So during this time frame, uh, between this point and somewhere this point, um, so this is the moment the master will read the data because from reading the ACK, uh, which is asserted now, that's a you know, logic high. Uh, we know the master knows that the data on the data bus is valid. So it's safe to read. And after reading the data, the master will deassert a request indicating that data has been read. Uh, and then this um, servant will uh, respond by deasserting this ACK and also um, deasserting the data. So the servant is ready for the next request.
The next one is a combination of both. Um, we can say there's a compromise and the physically we have a request signal, we have a wait signal and we have data, okay? The story is the same, well, the goal is the same. Master is trying to read data from the servant. In a fast response case, uh, as we show here, there's no involvement of the, this weight signal. So the weight signal is always deasserted, so it's uh, zero all the time. So this becomes a uh, typical strobe protocol. So the master requests the data after T access time, it putting the data, uh, valid data on the bus, and then uh, master reads during this time frame, and then master deasserts the request, and then finish the transaction. So in this case, the wait line is unused uh, because the servant is um, working as expected, is able to put on the valid data on the data bus within this T access time. But in some other situations, maybe the servant has to you know, wait for other events to happen uh, or um, some internal faults uh, causing delays. Uh, so after this T access time, it does not expect to produce the valid data. So if we follow still the first protocol here, then the master would try to read data on the data bus which is invalid at this point, because you can see here, the data is invalid during this time frame. So that's not safe for the master to read. And the servant needs to use wait signal to notify the uh, master in such case. So it will, in the second step, assert this wait signal. This is indicating, um, this is to indicate that uh, the servant is slow producing a valid data. And this wait signal is asserted, which will be seen by master because it's all connected. So the master sees it, this signal goes from zero to one. It knows that the servant is not ready, so it will not read. Okay, so, you know, when we move on further, the, at some point the servant has valid data, which is here. So this, you can expect a un, you know, uncertain amount of time, but servant itself knows when the data is valid. And after that, it will deassert with signal, okay, which is seen by the master again. So the master will go ahead, um, start reading uh, which is you know, somewhere here during this time frame. Once it finished reading, it will deassert a request uh, notifying the servant that you know this transaction is done. So this kind of design is very useful for the case when a servant is slow in responding. So with th these two control signals and this uh, strobe handshake compromise protocol, we can handle both fast response case and slow response case. Okay, next we're gonna talk about IO addressing. IO addressing is um, for the microprocessor to communicate with other devices using some of its pins. And we're gonna be looking at port-based and bus-based. So port-based IO or parallel IO uh, is when the processor has one or more n-bit ports. Uh, many processors, uh, for example, PIC microcontroller, uh, some of Atmel microcontroller has um, ports with names. And when you access such ports, um, this, this is still on inside the microprocessor, microcontroller. You can use uh, the names of the port. And the software reads and writes a port just like a register. 
uh, for example, you can say port zero, uh, assign a value uh, FF to that port, uh, or you can uh, get the, uh, the second bit of port one, get a value and assign to V. Uh, so this is something you can use uh, if that microcontroller or processor supports C language, which is most of the case. The other um, way to access the ports is to use bus. When we talk about bus, uh, we are talking about addresses and data and the control signals. Uh, we can use uh, these uh, buses to form, um, a, you know, to read a bus-based I/O device, I/O port. The communication protocol is built into the controller. You really don't have to um, use the software to uh, emulate the timing diagrams. Uh, most of the time, um, you you will just you know, use the address and use the data and you should be able to get the data correctly, uh, provided that your um, microcontroller is connected to uh, other components following the timing diagram. And in such case, uh, from the software perspective, you can use a single instruction to carry out read and write operations. There are some extensions of uh, such a design uh, for example, you can use parallel I.O. peripheral. If you, your processor supports only bus-based, uh, that means the processor itself uh, will need to have an address bus and data bus to access other components. Uh, if you really have to have these you know, ports, um, par par parallel I.O. peripherals, you can attach that to the bus. So this will be a secondary controller. You will be able to uh, read and write the registers here and then um, subsequently access this port A, B, C. The other one is extended parallel I.O. where you have these ports you, which you can access using their names as opposed to using the addresses. Uh, you can do that, uh, but also you can extend this using a parallel I.O. peripheral. Um, then from this port, you can access registers here and then from that, you can access other ports. Um, memory mapped I.O. and standard I.O. Um, so this is when we connect the microprocessor and microcontroller to I.O. devices, um, like we will do in our second lab, we will connect the Arduino to a I square C device. Uh, so that's another um, peripheral or device that you all uh, access. Um, for that, we will, we have two options. Um, for this kind of you know, situation, we have two options. One is use memory map IO, one is using standard IO. And depending on which processor uh, you choose to use and also the internal architectures of the processor. For memory map IO, you treat these IO devices as another memory location. If you recall uh, in, I think last week, we have shown you a memory map about the uh, microblades uh, processor and uh, it has a memory map. And uh, so those segments of memory, uh, some of them are used to access particular IO devices. Standard IO is where you uh, have dedicated uh, memory I.O. pin uh, to say what is the um, memory access, what is the I.O. access, uh, and that will uh, be used to differentiate memory access and the I.O. access. For memory mapped I.O., you don't need any special instructions. Uh, everything is treated as a memory address, so you, you don't really know what you're accessing uh, unless you um, Specific, you know, specify the address uh, and also the uh, resources on that address. Standard I/O, uh, where you will not use a general memory address, uh, you will use um, I/O instructions uh, to uh, access a specific I/O device. Okay, so here we are looking at a 
very basic memory protocol. Let me explain a little bit. So we have, um, so let's start from here. This is the 8051. This is a, a microcontroller, very popular. Um, you can see all, you know, many of such uh, microcontrollers in the field. And this microcontroller has several ports and also several um, pins. Uh, so P0, you can think about this as a named uh, port. So you can uh, access the 8-bit um, yeah, um, port. So you can access the, the values on these eight pins using the name of this P0, this port. Similarly, you have a port P2. Now again, you have eight bits here. Besides those, we have a few control signals, ALE, uh, address latch enable, um, write uh, control, read control. Uh, this is the, uh, I think the, uh, another um, enable signal. So what we're trying to do is, uh, we want to use this microcontroller to access uh, these two memory chips. Uh, one of them is, I think it's ROM, this is a read only, and the other one is um, is a RAM, so you can write to this memory chip. Um, but you know you don't have to worry about the actual chip itself. Um, what I want to show you here is to access these components, uh, you will need to use address, which is here A, A. Okay, for, so for these two two memory chips, you um, all need to use address, and both of them. Uh, needs 16-bit address. And when you access these memory chips, uh, for, for the case of ROM, so it's read-only, so you provide the address and you expect to get data out. So we have 8-bit data out. Okay. And these data, uh, these data bits, 8-bit um, data will be, um, you know, read to the microcontroller to do some computation. And for this, RAM chip, you can both read and write. So depends on the operation, you might you know, read data uh, from memory to the processor or write pro data from the processor into the memory. Either way, you need to use uh, these addresses. Now, here's the problem. Um, what is the problem? The problem is you, for, Addressing either one of them, you need to have 16-bit address. So if you use P0 alone, you cannot provide 16-bit address. Same case here, if you use P2 alone, you cannot provide 16-bit address. So that's the problem. So the solution here is to use this 74377 uh, sorry, 74373. This is a latch. Latch is an IC that can uh, basically uh, store the value that you put in. Um, so if you put a value here, one, and if you give a pulse uh, on this ALE, on this G signal, uh, you will be able to um, pass the value from the D side to Q side. So this chip will be able to store whatever value you put on the D and reflect on the Q until you next time update this value here. So that gives us a chance to basically store parts of the address, specifically to store eight bit of address using this Q and provide uh, the other eight bit of the address on the other port. And this is exactly what we're doing you, using this uh, protocol here. We have uh, first P0, um, uh, let's see, yeah, P0, we store the lowest eight bit of the address. So address bit seven through zero. And P2 stores the uh, higher half of the address. So bit 15 to eight. So the address will be put onto these two ports at the same time. And then uh, we see that um, at some point, this ALE is asserted. So you have a pulse here. 
And because you present the lower half of the address to the D side, so this latch will respond to that. As a result, on the Q side, on the output of the latch, you will see the um, lower 8 bit of the address going to be present on this side here. So what we're really doing here is this ALE will make sure that the both or well, all of the 16 bit address are going to be present with the combination of this Q and this P2. So in this way, uh, we are able to provide all 16 bit address to either one of these memory chips. And that's not the end of the story. Uh, because when you supply the memory address, you want to read data. Uh, let's see, we're reading data uh, from uh, one of the address, depends on we, which one we select. We can select using um, this, uh, uh, yeah, right. Yeah, we can, we can, we can select by using this um, uh, PSN here. When, when the data is read out of the chip, the memory chip, so it's going to be presented on this here. And that's why we perform the read operation uh, by asserting this read. So the data is coming out, and then uh, we will be able to uh, see the data on the P0 port. So the data will be present here, and then uh, the microcontroller will be able to read the 8 bit data uh, from this P0. So um, this is a very interesting uh, example, although um, you, you um, this is probably the first time you uh, think hard about the timing diagram to figure out what this actually does. But I think this is a good exercise for you to uh, understand these uh, concepts of control signals, buses, and the, how the timing diagrams describe the protocols.